Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. so Bob, if you'd be so kind as to introduce uh, Professor Wilson, that would be fantastic. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Uh, Hello to everybody and uh, welcome to the another in the series of webinars that the IAS is offering this uh, this winter. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Carol Wilson. She is a research botanist at the University of California, Berkeley, with a particular interest in irises, amazingly enough. So uh, she's a great person to talk about things like evolution and taxonomy, which are a major interest in this area. And uh, I did ask, ask her how she got interested in irises originally. And she told me that when she was doing her PhD, she asked some of the botanists around what would be a challenging group of, of uh, plants to study as a, as a research student. And I guess they pointed her to the Pacific Coast native uh, uh, irises in California, which is what she did do her thesis on. Um, she also checked with her grandfather, uh, as I understand it, and uh, asked what kind of plants he favored. And I guess irises must have been pretty high on the list there because they, everything came together and that was her choice. And that's what she's worked on um, considerably ever since. So uh, welcome to you all, welcome to Carol. And uh, she's gonna be giving two talks in this series. There's another one a week from now. The first one is on philosophy and methods of uh, discovery and naming of species, a sort of broad talk, but with special references to irises in China. Then uh, next week, she's going to focus in on the order, uh, the Iridae, the iris order, and talk about their taxonomy and some ideas about their evolutionary relationship and uh, how those have been derived. So those are two two to look forward to, and uh, I'll uh, step aside and let Carol take the floor and uh, ask her to speak on that topic of uh, philosophy and results of discovering and naming new species. Thanks, Bob, for the nice introduction. And um, I'm going to, throughout the slideshow, I'm going to show other pictures of other irises from China. and. Um, it's just to sort of make the talk a little more interesting and to make you feel like maybe you're in China and they're not necessarily related to the new species, but we'll get to that later. And also if there's no acknowledgement on the picture, then it's a picture that I probably took in 2010 when I was in China. I did bring home a few rhizomes, so it may have been something that I grew up, but most of them will have been taken then in in China in 2010. And the background, in fact, that I have is from that trip to China. Um, we were told that it was the Snow Leopard Mountain. I really haven't been certain that that was exactly right, but that's what our interpreter told us. So, so I'm going to start with a couple of um, kind of historical ideas about um, naming new species, and then I'll get into going through everything using the examples of these two new species from China. So, you know, why do we really worry about names on new species? And it's really a way to communicate um, the knowledge that we have about plants. And really early on in human communities, they were gaining plant knowledge and needing a way to talk about it. And so, there's an oral tradition in all indigenous populations. And the oldest oral history that we can kind of surmise is really probably 60,000 years ago, about 5,800 BC. And that's because at a Neanderthal site in Kurdistan, they found um, a lot of plant parts and plant pollen, knowing that they were gathering them and using them in different ways, probably mostly medicinal or eating them. And they, some of the plants that they were able to identify are yarrow and cornflower, bachelor buttons, 
um, grape hyacinths, horsetails, hollies, things that we know today, but we know that they were had kind of a, were gathering them and were uh, using them within their community. And then when we go to, a, and that's a picture of the cave that they found them in from Joseph V at Wikipedia. So then when we go to a rich in history, about 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians were using clay tablets. And some of these clay tablets actually had um, pictographs of various plants. And some of the ones that they were depicting and were using particularly are opium, myrrh, and um, beer grains. So there's quite a long history to the usage of plants and the need then to talk about them. And another thing, uh, other things that we know is in the Vedic literature, they, where they were particularly interested in the usage of plants of herbals, they have um, descriptions and these stylized illustrations. And many of those have not been identified because of they have this stylized drawings rather than kind of a more realistic drawing. And those were based, those are interesting because they were based on both plants that they were cultivating and also plants from nature. So they had a lot of um, forest species in, that they were depicting and um, writing about. So, you know, when we think of it, lots of times we think of Theophrastus, who was a Greek philosopher, and um, he published this De Historia Plantarum and um, De Caucasus Plantarum about the, um, you know, about the plants that he was aware of at the time. And in this, he listed about 500 plants and they're used for wood medicine and nutrition. And most of those were cultivated plants. But um, through Theophrastus, who was a student of Aristotle actually, um, and those that followed after him, his students and other philosophers and medical doctors, they really provided a lot of the names that we know today. Um, but not not really in the form that we know them, but um, some of the older known plants come from their time. So with that kind of very short history, because we don't really have time, I'm going to go through um, a project that I had that was naming a new species. And in 2008, Andrew Wheeler, who was a student of mine at Rancho Santa Ana, gave me a specimen that was collected by Daryl Probst in China. And I did some preliminary examination of the specimens, which I will go through some of that in a moment, and decided based on, um, based on this preliminary examination, it was new to science. And he collected this plant in central China in Gishou province. So the first thing that I do when I'm wondering what something is, is I start kind of looking through some of the floors of the region. So the floor of China was one that I consulted and also the iris of China um, by Wadek and Zeo. And so I look through there to look for plant names and descriptions that might have fit this one that Daryl had collect, collected in central China. And there wasn't really anything that fitted very well. I also, of course, looked at the general iris um, uh, books, particularly the one by uh, Matthew and the British Iris Society, and looked, to, looked particularly at the synonyms to see if there were any synonyms of plants that were similar to the one that I now had a specimen of. And I also use commonly these two um, published works, the work by Baker on the Iridae and also Ingler and Prantl's work on Iris because they have many of the older names that um, 
maybe have been put into synonymy and we might not be that familiar with. So I did um, quite a bit of work on that. And um, I also um, wanted to, uh, oh, and I, I forgot to tell you one thing, and that was to point out that there are 1,386 named iris species and subspecific taxa in tropicos. And so when you're thinking of naming a species, that's quite daunting that there are so many names out there already. And that's why you kind of start in a little slow looking at everything. But then I want to show you uh, some of the species that I've seen in China. And um, just to give you an idea of, of the diversity that's present in China, this is um, Iris Sichuanensis um, from um, Yunnan province and Iris Lactea from Yunnan province, Iris Tectorum and I from um, Sichuan province and Iris dolis siphon subspecies orientalis that was from the Tibetan plateau. And this last one, the Iris dolichosiphon, um, it was at a very high elevation, about 15,000 feet elevation. And it also is a very small plant. So if I had sitting behind it, my camera lens cap, it would um, encircle the entire um, plant. So it's a very small plant at that high elevation. So those are some of the plants that I, I collected there and some of the diversity that is present in China that I kind of had to go through. And there are about 62 recognized iris taxa in China right um, at this time. And I'll go through an example of what I mean by um, name species and taxa and subspecific ones next. So this is a pretty good example. It's Iris ruthenica. It was named by Kurgall in about 1808 or in 1808. And the, there are subspecies within it. And if we're talking about them in general, we use the word taxa. So a taxa could be a species or a subspecies or a variety. But um, in this case, I gave you an example of species, subspecies Breva tuba, Maxim dorinkin, and it was described in 1987, or it was actually in 1987, it changed rank. So the synonyms then are Iris ruthenica variety, Breva tubia by Maxim that he described in 1880, and Iris Breva tuba that was described in 1951. And so what you can see is there is kind of a change in rank. So I, Iris Breva tuba has been a species, it has been a variety, and it has been a subspecies all under Iris ruthenica. So that's kind of one way to give you an idea of how we think about species and the importance of knowing what the rank is, because that's something that you have to think about when you're describing a new species. Is it really different enough to be a species, or should it be in a rank underneath that species as a subspecies or a variety? And so one of the other things I did besides kind of look at the floor and think about some of the species that were common across China, I did also a quick little molecular preliminary study. And you can see the species NOV, and that just means new species. And this was just an analysis based on two molecular markers. And actually I included 180 iris taxa um, just to get an idea of where it fell out. It really looked like it belonged in what we would see as series chinensis, but I like to do that kind of check to make certain. And certainly it did fall out within 
the other IRIS series Chinensis group. So I was pretty certain at this point that I had a new taxa and that it was in the series Chinensis. And you can also see, we talk a little bit about branch links and you can see that it has, it has differences. You can see that it has a branch link there. Like, um, you know, it's pretty good size branch length. And so we know that it has quite a few changes along that branch um, between beyond the end, uh, between it and the ancestor of Odysseus and Iris Henrii. So once I knew that, um, you know, I had this new species, I started going through her herbaria. And when I was actually, when I was in China in 2010, I searched three different uh, herbaria there, the one in um, Beijing, the one in Yunnan, and briefly the one in Chengdu. They were not as open at letting me into their collections, but they did provide some collections for me to look at. I also went to Edinburgh in 2014 because they have a lot of collections from China and from, um, you know, kind of some of the areas around China. So some of the other Asian countries and they've done quite a bit of work on them. And so they have pretty new collections there. And I also wanted to talk to Henry who um, had worked quite a bit on the floor of China. And I wanted to kind of talk to him about this new species potential, potentially or probably new species and some other species that I was looking at that were quite different. So I was able to meet with him a couple of times and that was really great. So when I say that I looked at specimens in herbarium, herbaria, what I'm showing you on the top right is in fact a, a herbarium specimen. I guess my pointer will work. And this is what it looks like. It's a dried um, specimen that is mounted on paper. And this happens to be iris speculatrix in uh, one of the iris um, species I was particularly looking at because it also occurs in central China. And this is a picture of um, the director of the UC herbarium, um, Brent Mishler. And what he's pointing at, I think, is some sort of a list of species, but this is a herbarium cabinet. And so all of these specimens then are stored in herbaria cabinets. So each of the herbaria that I went to, um, this is what I'm doing. I'm going through all of these cabinets and going through all of these mounted specimens. And another, um, another um, reference that I used was the Chinese virtual herbarium because I was able to look at specimens that were collected after I was there in 2010, or at least were mounted and deposited in their collection after 2010. And I was able to look at some of the smaller herbaria that I was not able to go to. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about where all of that is used as it comes up. And so what was I looking for? I was really looking for this thing in blue here. And this is from Wadik and Zeo, because it, it, the plant that I was looking for is very similar to um, a plant that was called Iris henrii. And it had a small flower, about three centimeters, a short floral tube, long slender pedicel. This is a pedicel or the stem of the flower and it had a slender rhizome. And in fact, you can't really see the rhizome. I, this, this is more of a stolen, but they have some short uh, slender rhizomes there. And two of the other plants that were very, that are very common in central China and that I came across in the herbaria um, are Iris proantha, but it has a very long floral tube and also has a pretty stout um, rhizome and iris speculatrix, which has a thicker rhizome and also these four to five centimeter um, flowers. 
And so it was pretty easy to kind of tell these apart um, from uh, the one that I was looking at. So it made, it made my work in sorting specimens through all these herbaria fairly easy. And um, this is just a picture of two of the related species, just so you can see them not in a, a drawing, but as an actual plant. They're in the series Chinensis, Odesinensis, and Coriana. But one thing that I found as I was going through everything is, um, well, I guess to start out, I was always wondering about the description of Iris Henrii um, by Baker. I had, you know, Baker's monograph on the Iridae, and I had referred to it a lot, and I had read the description of Iris Henrii multiple times. And he said in it that the leaves were one sixth inch broad. And yet, when I looked at the flora of China, when I looked at collections that you can see here on um, the left top, I saw that the leaves were a lot smaller in the flora of China, in Wadik and Zeo, in um, Matthew's treatments, everyone was talking about leaves that were about two millimeters uh, or half that size. And I would say that was the largest um, specimens that I would find in the herbaria where they were labeled Iris henrii. So I really kind of wondered what is this thing that they're calling Iris henrii currently? And this would be it here. But whereas Baker was talking about something like this. And so I finally started looking at the, what they call the type specimen. And we'll, I'll show you the, this shows you the importance of it, but we'll talk a little bit more about a type specimen. And what I saw was that it wasn't a mistake in Baker's description that the plant he was looking at really did have leaves that were one sixth inch broad, much broader than what we were thinking of um, when we think of Iris henrii. So after studying um, a lot of specimens, I actually examined 450 specimens very closely, plus went through thousands of them kind of uh, superficially just to sort them out. I realized that Iris henrii that Baker described and the Iris henrii that I had used in my studies and that uh, most people were growing or recognized as Iris henrii were two different taxa. And the type of Iris henrii here on the right is from the British Museum, and it was collected during expeditions from 1885 to 1888. And it was collected by um, the, the collector Henry and then was named for him. Whereas this collection on the left was collected in an expedition from 1892 to 1903. And it's in the Paris Museum and Dykes assigned it to Iris Henrii. So Dykes was the first person that kind of said, oh, this narrow leaved plant is Iris Henrii. But after considerable search, I felt they were actually two separate plants. And there are some other differences I outline in my paper, but I think this is the one that you can clearly see. So now I realized that I not only had one new species, but I had two new species to describe. The one that um, Daryl had collected in Gizhau province and the one that had been um, considered Iris henrii for many years.
So I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of some of the other um, reference materials that I use. I use a lot of maps that were drawn um, by missionaries who were in China very early. The, um, they had um, Catholic missions in the 1500s that Jesuits did. And there were a, quite a lot of Protestant um, missions in China in the, starting in about the 1830s. And a lot of these um, early collections were by um, people who were at these uh, missionary, missionary sites in China. They were really the only um, people in there, I guess, um, from the Western world. There were a lot of people from the, Amer um, from the USA and some from Canada, quite a few from England. And this map is a map of what they call Hokuang uh, province, and that is present day Hubei and Hunan provinces. And we know that this map was made um, after uh, around 1644 because it includes areas of north of the Yangtze River, because before that, um, they, they stopped the, that Hunang or Hokuang uh, province be, um, below, the, um, below the Yangtze River. So I've spent a lot of time kind of researching and looking at a lot of these really old maps, trying to get an idea of where the missions were, what were the names so that I could apply them to the collections? What were the names of the locations? And um, I also spend a lot of time in older literature. This is a, a, this is a publication from 1905, and it's a description of Iris Cavalleria. And it is by, um, by Lavili. And it is a publication that I had been looking for for many, many years. And I actually found it during this study because it was always cited rather poorly, just as Chine and something, Chine and, Chine and um, what was it? Chine and Lilac, I think 1808. And that, you know, is really not a very good um, citation. So it took me quite a while to find it. And this was important to me because this is one of two synonyms of iris speculatrix. And I was really looking at iris speculatrix because it was, it is common throughout central China to see if there was any anything collected that was named and then put into synonymy with iris speculatrix that might be in fact the species that um, Daryl had picked up in um, his, his travels in China. So I don't think I've gotten any questions yet, so I'm just going to forge on ahead. So the next thing I um, wanted to say is, you know, I had this mounting proof that I really had two species that were new to science. And so now I'm ready to sit down and actually describe the two new species. I'd actually started working on the new species that Daryl had collected, but that kind of stopped when I realized that I was probably going to have a second species and I really didn't want to, I wanted to publish them together rather than publishing one and then publishing the second one. And I wanted to really sort that out so now I was kind of ready. And so then you have to turn your thoughts to kind of all of the rules of naming a new species. And it turns out that, that there's a, an International Botanical Congress held every six years. You know, most countries will have an annual meeting and then all of those um, societies will meet together every six years in an international congress. And part of that international congress, one of the sub areas, 
is the international code, the Committee on the International Code of Nomenclature. And they meet to kind of go over problems that have come up, any new um, ways they want to start looking at nomenclature, um, any new rules they might want to um, put in place or rules that they might modify. So you really have to go by this. And the main points of the rules of nomenclature are that sp species names are to be Latinized and they have to be unique. So you, there can only be one name for a species and um, they're, all species have to have a unique name. So the name cannot be used for its separate species. And why this, of course, has come up, it came up is because there was such a growing mountain of names, as you can kind of see by the number of names that we just have in Iris. And so they kind of decided, well, we've got to get organized on this and um, make certain that everyone is talking about the same plant when they use a name. So that's an important part of it. There's also a type specified now. In the past, there was not, and sometimes, and it made it very difficult to go back, as I did with Iris henrii, and really sort out, do I have Iris henrii, or do I not have Iris henrii? And then there's to be a description, and it's to be effectively published. And by effectively published, that is one of the things that's changed quite a bit over time. Um, effectively published means that it's published in a way that people can actually find the publication. So you had to publish it in a journal that would be um, not just your own little journal that you had for yourself and you didn't provide to anyone else, but actually a journal that other botanists could access. And now um, in the 2018 um, inter uh, committee, they decided that in fact, um, one could use an online journal. So now online only publications can also be used to publish a species name. So there have been changes over time. And one important thing that comes out that that the International Code of Nomenclature kind of covers and the committee spend quite a bit of time on is the rule of priority. And what that means is if you have two names for one plant, the older name has priority. And sometimes they make exceptions to that rule. And those exceptions have to go in front of the committee. But you can see that it is pretty important that you really research names before you name a species because you want your name to stand, not to be overruled by a former name. So that's one thing. And then other, just other things is that um, most journals uh, require an illustration, a map, conservation status and key to identify the taxon. It can vary a little bit, but that's what you kind of have to be prepared to publish. And also I'll talk a little bit about the names because there are no there there are, are no real rules except for the binomial part. The species name is Latinized and I and is binomial. But there are a lot of suggestions. And when we talk about priority, we really go back to Linnaeus. So Linnaeus is the beginning of modern nomenclature. And any um, name that Linnaeus had in his um, species plantarum is the first, is the legitimate name for that taxon. 
And this is because he was the first person who consistently used binomials, meaning a species would have two names, such as Iris henrii. They have a name which designates what genus is, it is in, that, at what it, where it belongs at the rank of genus, and wh what the name is for the species, which is Henrii. So that's the binomial. And of course, he was Swedish and, um, you know, initially was kind of out collecting plants and then went into medicine and then eventually came back to plants um, at the University of Uppsala as director of the Botanic Garden. So he published in 1753 and we go back to him in terms of names. There have been a lot of species, of course, named after his time, but we do recognize all of the names that are in, that he named or included in his volume. And here's just an example of a binomial, Iris Siberica. It is a Linnaean name. It was in his 1753 volume. And the old name for this species was really a short descriptive name. And it was Iris Corollis in Burbipus. I'm not that great with Latin, so on and so forth. And really what it, what that all translates to, I'm a little bit better at the translation than the speaking, is it has a beardless corolla, which is the sepals. And the fruit is three-sided, the stem is round, and the leaves are linear. And so he took that short description, what used to be, the name was a short description, and he said, no, we're going to have binomials. Some people were using binomials before, but he strictly used them. And so this name became a much easier name for everyone to remember. And so as far as the name for my new species, this is the decision that I made. I called it I, the first one from Gizhau province, Iris Propstii. And it has the authority after it so that everyone will know that it is in fact the species I named, not another species that someone named, um, you know, also accidentally gave the same name. And it is for Daryl and it has a Latin ending II. And it's recommended that um, it, those rules have changed quite a bit or those recommendations have changed quite a bit, but it's recommended that it have an I or an II ending if in fact the person that you're naming it for is male. It indicates a male. And for females, it's IAE, IAE um, it is the feminine ending. And um, for Iris Dabanchinensis, it's named for the Daba Mountains, which the using the name Sean for mountains, and it ends with E-N-S-I-S, -S, which is used, is the most common um, ending that based on geography. Again, there these are recommendations, and there are other endings that you can use. You know, you want something that kind of flows well, so it's nice to have a few options. So it's a, they're both binomials, they're Latinized, they have the authority, and I'm quite certain they're a unique name. You know, um, something could come up that I miss, but I tried to be pretty thorough on that. And I have here an example of some things that kind of go wrong when you don't have a unique name. So Iris gracilipes is the one that I chose an example, again, because it was synonymized with Iris speculatrix. So I was worrying about that um, synonym. And it was collected by um, Silvestri in the early 1900s. He was a, a missionary in China and he collected in Northwestern Hubei province and Pampanini, um, he sent it to Pampanini and Pampanini described in 1915. 
it is considered illegitimate. And the reason it's considered illegitimate is the name was already used by Gray for a plant collected by Wright uh, during the expedition in 1853 to 1856. And he described that plant in 1858. So the name Gracilipes was not available for this new plant that Silvestri, um, that, that Silvestri um, collected and that Pampanini described. So that plant would have had to have received a new name. Um, someone would have had to have come along later and renamed it. Instead, it was synonymized under Iris Speculatrix because whoever was looking at it um, decided that it was the same as Iris Speculatrix. And that is something that I hope to kind of resolve a little bit in the past, in the future. It does look pretty uh, synon, synon, it does look pretty much like Iris Speculatrix. I would not say the same for Iris Cavallari, but that plant is not as well known. There are not that many collections of it, so it needs a little more work. So that's kind of an example of what can go wrong if you don't have a unique name. So here's my tree then with the names that I've, I've assigned, the Iris Propstii and Iris Thalbancensis. And um, you can see it there. And so then I went about the other work, designating a type. So a nomenclatural type is a dried specimen, as I've shown you earlier, to which a taxon name is permanently assigned. And um, initially, when people were describing species, it was a lot looser before the, the kind of they've been working on these nomenclatural rules. Um, Usually people would use a lot of different collections or several different collections to describe a species. And they would kind of name them. They would say, oh, you know, I looked at such and such, a plant collected by this person and a plant collected by that person. And they'd usually indicate this in the publication, but they didn't really narrow it down very much. And especially when multiple names started cropping up um, based on the same plant, um, the example I just showed you of virus gasilipes, it was decided that really you need to nail this down. You need to give the botanist or the person, you know, an idea of what this plant actually is beyond a description, which can really be a little vague sometimes. So that's what happened. And um, this was based on a number of proposals to designate a type. And so it was a really, um, you know, it was a, a subject that received a lot of discussion. There were pros and cons to it, as we'll kind of talk about a little bit. Um, and there are two types of types the holotype, or there are a lot of types, but there are two important type of types and two that I was dealing with because um, there's a holotype or the, the specimen that is designated by the author as the type. And then there are isotypes and those are duplicate specimens that were collected at the same time, at the same place, on the same date, um, and you collect those just to distribute or, um, you know, in the past, lots of times people were collecting plants in the distant past um, as a way of making some money on the side. And so they would sell, they would make a collection and make several collections at that site and, and disperse it amongst several different herbaria or several different um, persons who were paying for specimens. So that, so really you have to come up with a holotype and an isotype. And um, and then these are some of the controversies. Um, 
some of the names, especially those that date, predate Linnaean, and a lot of the Linnaean names, they lack types. And so often people then later select a specimen to represent the type. And so that's, there are several types of those specimens that you can select and each of those has a different name, but none of them is a holotype or an isotype. And many, and you know, most botanists recognize that species change through time and that there is variation. And so that was one of the arguments against selecting a type because it makes it kind of too firm in the here and now um, for what might happen in the future or how to kind of consider the species as a whole. And a lot of people who felt that you should designate a type really looked to Aristotle and Plato who felt that species possess an essence. And this is kind of, this essence represents all of the variation, but can be seen in something real. And that real thing is in fact the type. And so some people kind of take this as a view of why there should be a type. Um, it's a view that is different from this polythetic view where it really has to be based on traits common to many specimens or looking at a bunch of specimen in order to come up with the description and the idea of what the species are, what is. And arguments really persisted um, that one specimen couldn't represent a whole taxon and additional specimens would improve description. So what they tend to do now is you have a type, you have to have a type, um, but lots of times you will also look at a few other um, specimens and you will note that in your publication. So the people have an idea of what you looked at as you decided um, that you had a new species. And um, something that I read recently by um, Dastin um, in kind of an essay on naming species, I thought it was, I thought this was good. So I'm just going to tell you what the quote was. She said that it's more like a wheel of comparison, each point along the hub representing an individual specimen connected along a spoke to the type at the center, as well as connected to one another by relationships of resemblance. And she, she talked about it as kind of like you have this family, you have this other, she and other people have talked about it. So you have this group picture of a family and you could think of that group as representing a species or you could have an individual and as representing that type. So it's kind of that sort of idea. But I thought her idea of a hub and spokes was kind of good for understanding what a type might be and how it really stands in for something that is broader than that one specimen. So, and here are the types I chose. So um, I could have chosen, I went through all of these herbarium specimens. I could have chosen an old specimen, one of the earliest collected specimens um, with Iris propsii, there were no specimens that I came across. So in all of the specimens I looked at, it didn't seem that anyone had ever collected this species and put it in a herbarium. Um, there may be one out there, but it wasn't in the herbaria that you'd really think of, the British Museum, Paris, all the museums in all of the um, herbaria in China, Harvard, Smithsonian, you know, all of those that you might think of, Kew, Edinburgh. I tried to look through all of those and I didn't come across another specimen of it. So I really didn't have a choice there. And so this is, um, the, this is the holotype. And then I have isotypes that I will send to, um, to China, to the herbarium in Beijing and to Edinburgh. 
And then for Iris Dabashanensis, I, I really did have some to choose from. There were 34 specimens that I found from nine separate collections and three botanists. Um, but they were either in China, the, all of the specimens that, the, that were collected at the time were either in China or they were in Paris. In the, in the museum in Paris. And so they weren't, the isotypes weren't distributed. They were held, or the, the potential isotypes were not distributed, but they were held instead in the herbarium, um, in the same herbarium. So, so I decided again to send those to the three. I could have sent it and I, thought about sending it to Harvard rather than to Beijing because Beijing had some very good collections, but sometimes it's really nice to have an official type. It would have been an isotype in the country of origin. So I did decide to send them to um, send them to um, Beijing as well. And I haven't actually sent them because COVID kind of happened and um, you know, I'll wait until all of that settles down and get them sent out. And here's a description. I don't expect you to read it, um, but you can see that you try to really condense it. Um, you use very um, standard scientific uh, words like spathulate or, you know, bilobe distally. And, um, you know, you really try to condense it, but make it quite thorough. And you can see that I talked here about seed and white appendages. And these are things that were not actually on the types. And I make that comment um, in um, the publication that I did look at other materials to kind of fill out this description. And I find then, oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, you sent isotypes uh, to China. Um, the holotypes, I'm assuming, are at Berkeley? Is that yeah. It? Yeah, and I haven't actually sent them yet because I'm kind of waiting okay. for the COVID yeah. thing to end. But yes, the, the isotype or the holotype will be at Berkeley. You know, um, there's that pride of your institution that you just kind of hold on to it. If, if you're at an institution that is large, you know, Berkeley is a large enough institution to have a big type collection. So yeah. And in, and in any herbarium, the uh, type specimens are their most valuable specimens in most cases. Yes, they are. And types and isotypes are kept separate in almost all herbaria from other specimens. So you usually have cabinets that just have types and isotypes. They're not in with the general collection in most herbaria. Um, and then one last question: Where was the uh, uh, the holotype for uh, Iris Henryi that you had mentioned? Uh, the um, it was at the British Museum. Okay. Yeah, and I I did not visit the British Museum. My uh, graduate student um, Lisa Karst visited it, and she actually had um, photographed and taken notes on that. And I also looked at it online. She had been there before I knew I would ever be that interested in it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions to kind of clarify the types? So now I want to kind of after that long thing, I want to show you some pictures of the new species. So this, this is, um, this is Iris propsii, and uh, this is a plant that uh, Daryl had sent to me. It's still in the pot, and you can kind of see this very long pedestal here, which is true according to Baker's description of Iris henryi and the specimen. It's true of Iris henryi, Iris propsii, and also Iris dabashanensis. So they all have these long pedestals, and a very um, short ovary here for Iris propsii. And um, a couple more pictures of it just to show it up close. 
Um, it has nice colorations with a yellow spot in the center. And I want to show you this picture where you can see kind of that ridge that is, a, is along the mid vein of the sepal, because that's very different than what you see in um, Aristaba shanensis. And you can also see here that, which is one character that I used in describing it, that the, the style lobes are sh rather short. They end before this large uh, signal patch here. And this is um, the Iris dabashanensis, and that's it growing. And here it is, it's, it's really crowded here because again, this is one that Gerald sh uh, sent me in a pot and you know, it's rather crowded, but uh, it would not be this in nature. It has um, a little bit longer floral tube, um, I do, you can't really see here the um, pedicels, but they're also quite long. But you can see these very narrow leaves. And one thing that I found quite interesting is here's this center um, ridge. You know, it's kind of has a crest along the center, a raised ridge, but it also has these two lateral ones. So it has quite a little bit different sepal than what we see in most of the series Chinensis. And then another picture of it showing actually very, very short um, stick uh, style lobes for this species. And then here are the drawings I included. Um, Diane Bland made the drawings and is acknowledged in the paper so that you can, lots of times drawings really help bring out um, kind of the characters of the plant. So it's a really nice thing to have illustrations in addition to photos, although they're not required. Um, some people use photos as illustrations, but I think they're nice. And then here's a map. You can see that, um, that uh, Iris propsii, what we know of it so far is really very limited. And it turned out that Iris dabashanensis, even though I was coming across quite a few collections, it's really very limited also just in the Dabasha Mount, in the Daba Mountains. So, um, so that's it. And you can get an idea of where they are relation to each other by seeing this Chang'an here. Um, and here it is. So one is south of Chang, south, um, west of Chang, southeast of Chang'ang and one is northeast of Chang'ang. And that's where the um, Jiling and Yangtze rivers come together. So that's the general region of it. And then I also did a key for it so that people could, um, you know, kind of identify it if they found one in the field. Um, and so uh, that kind of tells you kind of the whole story of how I went through um, this um, process of describing a species. And I thank you for listening to me. It looks like I went way over. And um, I want to thank Clyde Calvin, my husband, and Jin Yan Guo, who went with me to China in 2010, Daryl Probst, who sent the plant, and Jan Sachs and Marty Schaefer, who provided me with a lot of um, information and really some nice photographs, and Andrew Wheeler, who brought me the plant to begin with. So um, I don't know how to get out. Let's see, how do I end the slideshow? End the show there. Very interesting. That was wonderful. I, um... Well, I'm sorry it went quite so long. I think I kind of stumbled around a lot at the be very beginning. So, Carol, thank you so much. Are there any questions? Anybody that um, hasn't asked a question that wants to ask a question or that haven't typed a question, uh, let us know. Um, and uh, everyone can unmute themselves now and or um, uh, share their video if they want to. 
And uh, Carol, thank you so much. There was, this was really, really interesting. I can help you. Uh, I can stop the sharing right now. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, but unless we have any questions, we are going to stop now. And um, we wanted to let you know that there is another webinar next week uh, coming up on Wednesday and the invitations will be sent on Friday, once again, through news and notes. And um, we have more webinars coming up in uh, the spring. Uh, be on the lookout for, for more uh, notifications. And um, also, um, uh, Gary, do you have any questions that you recorded through the chat? By any no, chance? we don't have any others. Um, it, it, just some comments, very, uh, very informative and interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was interesting. I have to say good night. Um, uh, Jean Richter says, th uh, thanks very much. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Could I uh, have a word, Bob Hollingworth? Yes, yes. Uh, it's not so much a, a question as a sort of a comment. Um, I was a little surprised that, uh, Carol, that, that most of your way of characterizing these species was done by morphology. And I, I would have thought there might have been more molecular genetic uh, work done to establish the relationships. I know nothing about plant systemics, so <laughs> t tell me how that works, will you? <laughs> well, um, you can use molecular data to establish species, and they call those species cryptic species usually because you know you don't notice the morphology, but when you look at their genetics are quite different. In this case, really, I had something that was morphologically different from everything else. And so I think that's the place to start. Okay. I have a study right now um, underway. I have all of the data back for it, but it it's a very large, I'm dealing anymore, everyone is with these really large data sets where you know, I have over a hundred molecular um, nuclear markers and the entire plastome. And I have that, a lot of that data back for a lot of the series chinensis. So I should be able to really, um, well, I guess I have about half of the data back on that. Um, I'm still, it, because I kind of stopped when the whole COVID Thing happens. Yeah. And we'll start that back up when I get back in there. But, um, you know, I should have a pretty good idea of, you know, more evidence on relationships amongst the series chinensis and particularly for um, not only these new species, but also Iris uh, proantha that um, preliminary studies showed that um, the subspecies in Proantha valida and Proantha are not related, don't appear to be very closely related. And so, you know, kind of investigating that a little bit, I'm trying to actually find a specimen of a living specimen of Iris henryi, which I don't have at the moment. Um, there's a person who's willing to, who's going to look for it, but again, um, she couldn't travel there this spring. Um, because of COVID. So, you know, there's a few loose ends on that study that I'm, I'm hoping to, um, you know, to be able to finish that. Um, there was the initial site for Iris Henry, I was probably lost uh, when they built the dam, the big dam there in central China. Um, but uh, there were some other collections that are very similar and in the air right in that area, not that far apart way. And I'm hoping to get a specimen from one of those sites. So, okay. you know, the molecular studies lots of times kind of, uh, you don't have to wait a while till you get everything together. <laughs> but it is coming, huh? It is coming, yeah, it is coming. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, appreciate the answer. We, we have a question from Bob Priest. Bob, you wanna unmute yourself and there yeah. Um, Carol, have you looked into, I'm not sure it, it's even as important as it used to be, but 
uh, are you interested in uh, chromosome counts and things like that today still? Well, you know, chromosome counts, I think, can be really useful. Um, I, you know, the, the best chromosome counts are from meiotic material, and it's, it's really kind of hard to get um, in iris because um, meiosis happened so early. Um, that's, you know, in the flowering bud before it actually flowers. So, um, you know, it, you would want to get it, um, you know, from a pollen before it, it divided or from an ovule. So, and that, that can be really challenging material to get. And I am, I have done a few root squishes, um, you know, but I'm not the best at chromosome accounts. I must say, this is not where my talent lies. Now I have sent leaves in for what they call um, flow cytometry, where they look at um, the amount of genomic material that you have, just a count, kind of an estimate of the genomic material. And that can tell you lots of times, give you an indication if you have a polyploid or something. So that can be useful, but I'm just not the best at counting chromosomes. Yeah. The, the chart you had uh, looked as if it was a cladistic analysis. Yeah. Uh, when you do that, do you do anything besides morphological data? Oh, no, that was all based on molecular data. Okay. Yeah. So I did, I did. Um, sequence, um, you know, the new species for a couple of markers. And, um, you know, that gave me the assurance that, that really they were separate enough to be recognized at the rank of species, you know, rather than as a subspecies. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. I think this uh, shows us how involved all of this is, the whole process and naming a, a new species and uh, what you have to do to, uh, to document it. Um, did you, one question I have is, uh, did you borrow specimens from various herbaria at, to, to be sent to Berkeley to, to study in this? Or, well, I know you went to China and to Edinburgh and uh, various herbaria, but. Right, I didn't, I did not borrow specimens. Um, the, the, it, instead I did go to the herbaria. I had been to Kew earlier and had notes from it. And um, my student had been at the British Museum in Paris and she had notes as pictures from there. But now that so many herbaria are online, um, a lot of this can be done without borrowing specimens. I did, I did um, have to, um, I did contact the herbarium in Florence and ask them if they would send any specimens of certain, or any specimens or images of specimens, of certain specimens that I wanted. Um, I mean, names, I didn't know what their specimens were, but I suspected because there were several missionaries that were from Florence that they would in fact have their holdings. And they, they did, that's where I actually got the type for Iris Crisilope's pamp was from um, Florence Herbarium, which did not have specimens online. But they sent me an image because types and specimens and all of this, they're so valuable that herbaria really would prefer that you either come there to study anymore right. or that you look at, at least you look online. And if there's something you really need to see and you cannot come, then you can request it. Yeah. There's one more question. Um, where is your next exploring for Iris? Someone asks. Well, you know, I actually, I have um, a project on the California irises and I have not finished that field work. So my next one is in 
California. And I particularly have not finished the Sierras. So I'll be over in the Sierras um, in the spring. Yeah, so I have, I have that going on. I actually, it's kind of exciting because one part of that, something that got kind of added to that is um, a, a study that I had funded that will theoretically, and I have my fingers crossed, I think it's gonna work, it will give us the first whole genome of virus. Yeah, so I'm wow. kind of excited about that one. And luckily, I don't have to do all the work. You know, a lot of time, I spend a lot of time in the lab, and I would rather do other things. And um, this uh, proposal that was funded um, provides quite a bit of money for the work to happen at UCLA. So they will actually, um, you know, make the libraries and, and do the sequencing. I just have to tell them what I want and guide them along. Yeah, so that would be good. I think that'd be a good resource. And Carol, uh, we still have that question that Ellen sent. I don't know if you want to do that or, or not. It's up to you. Ellen yeah, Merger's you know, he asked me, I don't yeah, have you know. it up in front of me right now, but give me a second. Um, he asked, um, how can we access the variability of a species if it's only been collected from lone, one location? Um, you know, and then he goes on to say what makes a plant unique enough, and Iris bakeriana is the example he gave, um, which there's been a lot of controversy about, and that is a problem. Um, Iris propsii, as you can see, is pretty restricted in its distribution, but it it is found on a very unique limestone karst uh, um, you know, subsoil. So I think, I think it will be found. Um, other populations will be found um, in the area and on similar substrate, but it just hasn't been looked at. But there is a problem if you name a species from only one site. You know, there are two sites known for Iris propsii, which is not a lot. So how do you know if it's different enough? I think that's why I ran my little molecular study. I didn't want something that wasn't different. And it's molecularly different and morphologically different and is on a little bit different substrate than most plants. So I think it's good. But Bakeriana actually, I'm trying to finish up a study that includes um, Baker, Bakeriana and, and a lot of people don't recognize it and I'm just not certain. The reticulatas are particularly a challenging group, I think. You know, there's a lot of variability. Um, so I can't really tell him what I think on Bakeriana, whether or not it is true. But I think his question of when is something distinct enough and whether uh, one site is, um, you know, really important. Um, Question and he he points to chromosome counts and of course uh, in the reticulatus there's been a lot of reports of polyploid, um, you know so that might help quite a bit. But with these um, with this new way of looking at molecular data, you can also get an indication if something is a polyploid. So you know hopefully that will come up. So. But anyway, that was his main question. Um, and, uh, you know, then he asked some other questions like, you know, how can we tell how it evolved? Well, that involves a lot of studies, you know. I mean, I think I'll touch on quite a bit of that next week when I talk about phylogenies. And that's really going to be molecular data driven. Um, you can do phylogenies based, you know, trees based upon morphology, but they're pretty unsatisfactory because you just don't have enough characters. So you tend to use molecular data. So I think I've kind of answered most of his. Um, yeah, but he, he did ask quite a few questions about the reticulatus, which I would just tell him that I'm working on that. And I think I will be coming back to him with a lot of questions 
you know. So. <laughs> uh, Alan is here and he can tell you. <laughs> and um, okay, yeah. I, and we have another question from Carrie Peterson. Carrie, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, is it possible to get a copy of the slide which had the pictures of your two irises you named? Um, you know, I think isn't the webinar going to be available? Yes, the webinar is going to be on YouTube, but I think she's asking for the pictures, right? The pictures. And, you know, um, it would be, I mean, I think people just have to email me if they want you know, some specific thing a and I can provide them. Yeah. Okay, okay. your email is? Or, or Carrie, you can send your uh, question to AISWebinars at gmail.com and I'll forward that to, uh, to Carol. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome Any, anytime. And be patient because I, I some, sometimes a little slow on answering emails, but I'll get to it. Okay, um, I, I have a question, which um, is just a general question. When we look at uh, Spiria irises, there are lots of them that are subspecies. Like it, it would say Spiria such and such, and then sus what's the difference between a species and a subspecies and why there is such a difference? Well, um... You know, that's really up to the person doing the classification, what rank they choose. But most people feel that uh, a subspecies or variety for that fact, that what they are are taxa that are, are not fully split from the parent taxon, that they're not that they haven't gained enough changes for, they're usually talking about morphology, either molecularly or morphologically, to really be certain that they're going to persist as an entity. You know, they may in fact be able to interbreed. So they might come back together and interbreed and then that distinctiveness might be lost. So it's seen as a partially formed species, uh, typically. And it's, it's where you put things that you're really not quite certain that it has enough difference to be a full-fledged species. Yeah. And the, in the spurias, the spurias really need some serious work. I had a student come um, for six months from Iran, and she was kind of interested. She came on a specific project, but she was kind of interested in working on this series. And I encouraged her when she finished her PhD, in fact, to go in that direction. And I don't know if she will, but they need some very serious work. Most of them are in Europe. A lot of them are in the, in the Caucasus. And some of those regions can be hard to collect in. Um, but uh, they do need some serious work because uh, Morphologically, you know, they're just not very well defined. There's, a, there's a couple of um, comments and questions in the chat uh, from Jan and Marty says, we will work on getting photos of the new irises on the wiki. Oh. And um, uh, then there's a question um, uh, from Jiayong B. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. May I ask where you will publish these new species? Well, they've been published and they were actually published in in Phytotaxa, and that um, that publication is free to anyone. That's one of the reasons I published there is because it is an open access journal, and yet quite well respected. I I'd never published there before. You know, I'm a member of the Botanical Society and the International Taxonomist, and I've you typically published in those journals that associated with the societies I belong to, but I decided to publish this one in Phytotaxa, so it would be available to people. And um, I can, um, you know, somehow I can send information maybe to the to someone, and that can be. Uh, how could I get that? You can send that to me, Carol. Okay. 
Yes. I'll send I'll send the link to Andy and anyone can just go online and download it. It's it's available. And it does have those color pictures in it, but I'm also willing to send slides to people if they want them. And Bob Priest. Carol, Carol um I'll I, I don't have I'm pretty sure I don't have ours probes di and Dabashiana Debashiensis on the wiki, but I'll put them up in the next few days. Um, and people can add information. I'll try to find the link to Phytotax and put it in, in there. Definitely. And uh, anything you want to add, but give me a couple of days to get the pages up. Yeah, and you know, um, the, the pictures that I showed were mostly ones that I took, but um, that's because they had to be of the specimens I was looking at when I described it. But certainly, Marty and Jan have some excellent pictures too. So, yeah. And somebody just put in the. Uh, I think Olga just put the uh, the link in chat for the um, the article. Okay. Uh, Two new species in IRC series Chinensis from South Central China. So um, you've got the link there if you want to copy that or just link uh, click on it now and you can go right to it. Right. Okay, everyone. Well, Carol, thank you so much for speaking tonight. We hope to see you next week and everyone else. Thank you for attending and don't forget to register after you get the invitation on Friday. Yeah, and I will try to get that one going faster without all these problems and so that uh, no we don't problem. go too late. No problem. My husband's really hungry. He's unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> this was wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, it was really, really nice. And and by the way, uh, next week, if anybody has more questions, feel free to email them to us in advance. Or if not, we'll we'll repeat some of the information again next week. Okay. okay good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.